Like all of us, in March of 2020, I was faced with a lot of uncertainty, an unstructured schedule, working from home, learning Zoom, and I really didn't think that a pandemic could actually happen and that we would be at home. And I thought that this would be a temporary thing. Well, when April rolled around and I was starting to go a little bit stir crazy and realizing that things were not gonna go back to normal as quickly as I had hoped, I started thinking about ways to steady my mind, to find a safe space, to really lean into things that inspired me and gave me a sense of well-being. And for me, as an indigenous person, that means really leaning into my culture, my history, and the work of my ancestors. And one of my best friends, her name is Ashley Lumboy, she's Wakamasuan, we were having a really wonderful conversation and thinking about what are ways that we can continue to do the work that brings about reclamation of our culture that's been lost and quite honestly, a lot of it due to colonialism. And so one of the things is bringing back ceremonies that are meaningful and have facilitated um, difficult times that we've experienced in the past. And one of those ceremonies is green corn. And green corn is an annual ceremony that took place throughout the Southeast. It still does in many tribal communities uh, throughout the Southeast and even Oklahoma, where tribes were removed from the Southeast and, and taken to Indian, Indian Territory. So green corn was a very important ceremony. One of the main parts of green corn that we don't have, which is why the ceremony doesn't exist anymore, is that we don't have our ancestral corn. Now there's varieties of kind of a hybrid Indian corn that exist, but that really distinct corn that would have been used for green corn ceremony, as far as we know, didn't exist. And she and I had this conversation about how hurtful that was and where could it be and what happened to specific varieties of corn. And about four or five days later um, in April, I woke up and just had this insatiable desire to try Carolina Gold Rice. And it was really inexplicable. And I'm sure all of you have had these experiences before where you're really driven to do something or motivated to do something and you don't understand why and it's just kind of on your radar for the day. Well, and I am attributing a little bit of this to the pandemic too, right? So I, have been interested in Carolina gold rice. It's a little bit of a prov provocative cash crop. It is tied to slavery. And I have an ancestor who was in Georgetown, South Carolina, who was actually indentured during the 1700s at a time when rice was thriving. So I've really put those two histories together and I've been very curious about them. And I've attempted to try Carolina gold a few times and I haven't been able to do it. And for whatever reason, that day, it was on my mind and I thought maybe I could drive down to Columbia, South Carolina, uh, where Anson Mills, who um, sells Carolina Gold Rice, and actually the gentleman who owns Anson Mills is credited with restoring Carolina Gold Rice uh, back to its original uh, seed. Um, I thought I could drive down there or see if there were any vendors close by. So I got online, I looked at their website, I found Carolina Gold Rice was available. I put it in my little virtual cart and I was ready to check out. And then I see all of these other menu of great food items um, that were available. And I thought, well, maybe I should buy something else. So the rice is in the cart and I look at other things and immediately uh, Carolina Gourd Seed Corn caught my eye. And I thought, well, what is this? So what's great about Anson Mills and Glenn Roberts for that matter, is they include these bios of food on the website. So as I'm reading about Carolina gourd seed corn, it says found in a bootleggers field in Dillon, South Carolina, was traded among native peoples and colonial settlers in the 1700s in Dillon, South Carolina and immediately my eyes just became as round as saucers. I could feel them and I thought, well, if this corn was traded to a bootlegger or to a colonial farm in the 1700s and it survived in a bootlegger's field because it's the preference of the quality of corn, 
this is our ancestral corn. And I just stood there and I reread the, the description over and over and over again. And I thought, how could an ancestral corn survive about 20 miles from Pembroke, North Carolina, and we not know about it or have access to it? And so I do what I do. I called Anson Mills and was hoping to get to the owner of the company. Um, and I, the lady that I spoke with was very nice and I asked her questions about the Carolina gourd seed corn and she politely said, you need to talk to Glenn Roberts um, about this and he can give you more information. And so thankfully he called me back later that day and he sort of opened Pandora's box for me. He said, yes, this is your ancestral corn. We have waited for someone like you to call us for years uh, to reconnect you with this corn. And he says, not only is there Carolina gourd seed corn, but there are many other varieties of corn that still exist and are being cultivated in different parts of the country, specifically in NC State. So he completely opened Pandora's box and I was blown away. And he talked about varieties like Bloody Butcher, Sea Island Flint, the Carolina Gourd Seed. And I asked him, why don't any of us know about this? And he said again, I've waited for, we've been waiting for someone like you to call and to reach out to us. And I was taken aback by that a little bit, but I thought, about the conversation that Ashley and I had. And in that moment, I said, all we can do is move forward. I asked him, would it be possible to connect these varieties of corn and specifically these programs like the one at NC State uh, with Dr. James Holland? And there's another uh, Dr. Martha Wilcox who was working at a program in uh, Mexico to work with native people in North Carolina to return this corn back to indigenous peoples. And he said, absolutely. Um, and that's really how an initiative was born uh, to return corn back to indigenous communities in North Carolina. So I talked to, within a matter of two days, um, both Glenn Roberts, Martha Wilcox, who was just doing incredible work down in Mexico with indigenous communities, actually working with a lot of the same varieties of corn that was indigenous to North Carolina. And it just blew my mind, the, the information that existed, right? And we had just had a conversation about green corn saying how sad this was that our corn didn't exist. And now not only does it exist, it is thriving. And it's being programmed by universities, by organizations, even by on a, in a commercial way with people um, where the corn is being cultivated by indigenous communities in Mexico and it's being sold to restaurants in the United States. What? How does this happen? It was crazy. All of that information really fueled me more to say, I need to get Native community organized through my role as a museum director. And really, as I see Indigenous museums being most powerful as a platform to facilitate these types of opportunities. So I scheduled my very first Zoom meeting with Native community and all the folks that I just mentioned, just to kind of bring us all together to have a conversation. And we all shared the same sentiment that I had. How do we not know about this? But also it was sort of like, I don't know, a resurrected, resurrected ancestor walked in the room. It was just absolutely incredible that this corn did exist and that it was accessible and that we could have seed and that we could plant it and eat it. And there were varieties even through Ants and Mills that we could consume, like Ants and Mills for the Carolina Gourd Seed had cornmeal and corn flour and grits, like things we could actually taste then, right? The, the labor, the engineering, the science, the knowledge of our ancestors was accessible. And I still have trouble wrapping my head around all of this and kind of articulating it all because when we think about what's been lost to indigenous peoples, sometimes it's right in front of us in plain sight, whether it's a landscape, um, our water, our foods. But the transformation is just either unrecognizable or it's out of reach or our interpretation or our use of these things are different. But this was weird because this corn was pristine and it was in its original 
uh, stayed as it was hundreds of years ago. So we had this initial meeting and uh, it took about seven or eight months to continue organizing and community really had to wrap their head around, what does this mean for us? And so we ultimately planned uh, when it was safe, and actually a whole year later in March of 2021, a corn reclamation meeting. And so Dr. Uh, James Holland came out with some of his staff from NC State. Uh, they brought corn seed with them that they have in a seed bank and also that they grow to produce seed. Um, Dr. David Shields from the University of South Carolina um, at Columbia, who is a food historian, brought some of his own personal seed. And we had three tribal communities that came together on this day. And we met outdoors. It stormed like nobody's business. There were lightning bolts that were striking down around us. We just kept going because it was so important and it really kind of provided the perfect scene for what was happening, right? It just felt epic in a really big way. But uh, the Waccamaw Suwan got back there, Sea Island Flint. Dr. Shields was very intentional about handing them handfuls of corn seed and saying, this belongs to you. You guys engineered this because the Sea Island Flint, uh, the stalks are sort of wafy, so they can deal with coastal winds better than more stronger stalks that you would find in more inland and other fields. And just the women that accepted that back we're so moved. I mean, we were all brought to tears. The Lumbee received several different kinds of corn. The Kohari received several different kinds of corn. And that corn ended up uh, being planted by all three tribes. But the one that it took hold the strongest among, and this was also part of what NC State was curious about to see along with the other scholars and scientists that had been working with the corn, is how will this corn produce or thrive back in indigenous homelands? How will it re-engage with, with the community, with the people themselves, with the people that engineered it? And so uh, the Waccamaw Suwon actually had a beautiful planting ceremony in the spring. Um, it was intergenerational. There were children there and elders. There were prayers and songs that were sung. Women wore ribbon skirts. It was just, and they welcomed that corn back. It was just one of the most moving experiences that I had ever had and that corn thrived. And I forget how much they ended up yielding um, later that season, but they produced enough to uh, create their own bank of seed to share with community. And now they're talking about bringing back green corn. This jumps way back a year before to that conversation I had with my best friend, Ashley. So I feel like we put it out in the universe, right? And it responded and it came back to us as indigenous peoples. Now they've planted another harvest. This is their second harvest or their second planting of the Sea Island Flint and they're planting ceremony around it and the possibility of green corn coming back. People are eating it. People are getting that seed and sharing it among community. It has been one of the best experiences of my life being able to uh, have this opportunity to work on this project. It's still going. We're still working with more tribes. And I, like I said before, the role of the museum is just to help bring people together and to organize. But I think the biggest takeaway is unexpected opportunities are given to us. And it's up to us to follow through with the mission and goals to fulfill things that are meaningful and important. And that's just answering the call. And it can be simple things like just getting through the semester or finding your way in your first year of school or becoming active in whatever it is that you're interested in, but just know that your actions are meaningful and that you can make a difference in your own personal life, but definitely in the lives of many others. And that what you're interested in and what you are doing is important and it means something.